Welcome back to the Rydell Law Firm YouTube channel. Today we are going to chat about a hot topic, a uh, controversy in the, in the franchise industry, the collapse of Anchor Tiny Homes. It was fast and furious and a spectacular blow up that happened um, this past month, this past couple of weeks, which is just crazy. So before we do that, uh, Rydell Law Firm, we help with folks understanding their franchise agreement, signing franchise deals, and also starting franchises, right? We also help in Texas business, and we do international trade. So if we can help you with any of those, or you got questions, reach out. Love to chat with you, see how we can bring value to you. Um, so let's chat about Anchor Tiny Homes. This is an interesting one. So Anchor Tiny Homes, uh, we represented, so Rydell Law Firm, we actually did represent a handful of the first, um, definitely the first five franchisees, at least one of them. And I think we represented two in the first 10 or 15 franchisees that signed. Um, and then subsequently we represented another third or fourth in the last two years. So we, we represented some early adopters of the Anchor Tiny Home system. And we went over those documents, those FTDs, you know, early on. Now, when you're looking at startups, I will say that startup franchise systems, um, there's sometimes a knowledge gap, even with the FDD, right? Because we don't know a lot. There's not a track record, right? There's not a history that the, the franchisor can uh, share, right, and can disclose, unfortunately. So there is some inherent risk with startup franchises, and this that's definitely a, a, an aspect of this. But, um, yeah, so let's talk about what happened specifically and why it wasn't in the FDD or why we weren't able to identify that. So what had happened is that the franchisor has affiliate businesses, which is typical, right? This to system, Anchor Tiny Homes, had an affiliate that uh, did construction on that owned a big group of territories. I think it was like, I don't know, 20 or 30 territories, as they defined it, in California, where they were the only ones, the, that franchisor's affiliate was, was only permitted to offer tiny homes in those territories. Very, very big space, big uh, group of territory. I think it was huge, like 20 or something. Um, and that affiliate was responsible for the sales, the build-out, and you know managing those, those projects, just like franchisees would be. But that affiliate was owned by corporate, right? It was owned by the owners of the franchise system. And what happened was that, as far as we can tell at this point, that affiliate company was mismanaged, mismanaged from the top. They, the, um, the crews were independent contractors, and they were not sent to prioritized client um, projects from what we see. They were sent to personal projects of the owners of the franchise system, unfortunately, they also were not being paid. So folks, uh, customers of Anchor Tiny Homes, the corporate affiliate would pay. I think they paid it all up front, uh, or quite a bit of it up front, from what I understand at least. And that was supposed to go to fund the build out, right? Um, just like building a, a regular home. You pay the builder, uh, usually milestones or whatever, um, as in they're supposed to, to build the home, right? To, they use that to fund it and then get a another payment at the end um, as either profit or, or the last remaining amount. Uh, that's what's supposed to happen. Didn't seem to happen here. It was mismanaged, misspent. Um, and maybe they, maybe the costs, maybe they weren't tracking costs right. Uh, some of the homes that I saw, the, the prices were around like anywhere from 40 to 60 or 70,000, which was interesting to me because I'm looking at my franchisee clients info and it's like their their homes start from 60 or 70 go up that's the minimum and that seemed to be somewhat of a ceiling at least from what i saw on the corporate side uh the corporate affiliates units that they were offering the, the build outs so well, that's that's what we know now what happened uh this summer summer of 2024 is that uh some of the um staffing what what happened first was i guess people started realizing and complaining to franchisees that Anchor Tiny Homes isn't building homes and they're a scam. And franchisees realize that it's an affiliate of the corporate unit, which is causing all these bad reviews and causing hesitation in their own sales. And when that started coming out, the franchisor downplayed it um, quite a bit. But then within a couple of weeks, 
or at least from when my clients became aware or at least reached out to me, within a few weeks of that, uh, the franchisor fired their franchise staff. They laid everybody off. And from what I could tell, um, they didn't pay some uh, some of those people for working, which is illegal, frankly. Uh, but I don't know that that'll have to come out in California, or whatever um, you know, whatever it happened to those folks. But the indication was from the people that got laid off is they they weren't paid for the previous two weeks of work, which is ridiculous. Um, and so at that point, then I think a few days after they laid off other franchise staff, all the ads got turned off, and then corporate went dark. And I think the owner, or the CEO, or whatever, sent an email saying it, it's over, right? They're they're shutting down. Um, and subsequently, I'm seeing reports, the uh, just news reports in California that they have either already filed the owners individually uh, for bankruptcy, or they are preparing. They've made a statement that they're going preparing to file bankruptcy. So it's uh, it's crazy. There's some stories out there already. The news in California talking about some of the spending of the owners of Anchor Tiny Homes, um, you know, lavish cars and, and homes that they had and remodeling that they were doing when they weren't building homes for folks who, who needed it, you know, spent their life savings of fifty or $60,000 to build themselves a home that didn't get built. So absolutely a travesty. Uh, so, you know, what do you do as a franchisee? Let, let's pivot there. Um, as a franchisee, when a franchise system collapses or goes into a bankruptcy, your franchise agreements are still operating, right? You can still, uh, operate under the trade name. You can still operate under that system. Now it depends on what happens. If the franchisor goes into bankruptcy and somebody acquires the assets in the bankruptcy, including the franchise agreements then that person or entity that assumes those agreements will continue to operate the system, right? They will continue. They will have to abide by the franchise agreement. So that's some good news. Now, on the other hand, if there is not a uh, bankruptcy or, or if there is no, I, I doubt there, I, I think there has to be at this point because there, there are, de- there are um, creditors that are calling in debts and they have to handle it in a bankruptcy. But uh, for example, if there wasn't a bankruptcy and it just slowly died or disappeared um, or collapsed and just nobody's there left, franchisees, and I've had franchisees in this situation too, and I tell them, look, we'll just operate as you were. You can change the brand if you want, frankly, at this point, if the franchisors collapse. Um, but if you're getting traction and you're known under that trade name, I say, you know, keep doing it, keep operating. Because frankly, the franchisor doesn't exist any longer. The franchisor is not going to come and try to enforce the franchise agreement. Where, where are they going to get the money? What are they going to do? Right? So the risk is lower. Now, there is potential risk. There's potentiality there that you may get hit with a cease and desist or a lawsuit. But the practical reality is that very, it's very, very unlikely that that will happen. So that's sometimes counsel to clients tell them, hey, just continue operating. If someone sends you a letter <clears throat> or tries to get you to stop, call me. Let's look at it, and we'll see if we need to to change the trade name at that point, the brand, or the logo, or whatever. But otherwise, who's who's the sheriff that's going to come and you know take you take you to jail? There ain't none. So that's sometimes a solution. Uh, other other solutions are to actively negotiate an exit from your franchise agreement. Honestly, that's a tough one too. Uh, it's t- depending on the franchise or situation. With Anchor Tiny Homes, that was a consideration we had with with clients. Um, but frankly, I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't uh, optimistic that it would lead to anything. First of all, the franchisor needs to have a reason to just break the agreement, right? To terminate the agreement, um, and just asking them nicely ain't going to cut it. It's that, that's no, there's no leverage there, right? So what's the compelling point to make to the franchisor for them to terminate the agreement with you mutually? Just asking is not enough. Um, now, potentially threatening a lawsuit could be enough, but then if they call your bluff, which most franchisors and businesses are doing and will do, just say, okay, if you think you have a claim, go file a lawsuit. It's going to cost you ten or $15,000 to do that to start, and we'll see how it shakes out in the end. Right. If your claim is not strong enough, you may lose. 
So, um, so we looked at that. We thought about negotiating a termination. I didn't see where the leverage points were, uh, to be honest with you. At, even at that point, there's still stuff we didn't know about it yet um, when we were talking about this a few weeks back. But, um, you know, I didn't see... I didn't see a pressure point that really made sense for us to push hard and to tell my client, I think we can get that outcome. Now, the second part of this problem, too, is if the franchisor disappears or goes dark, how are you going to reach them? How are you going to reach them to actually get to a negotiated point? And that's the problem that a lot of them are having right now. The franchisor just is totally disconnected. There's nobody reaching them. There is nothing. There is nobody left to negotiate with. There's nothing happening. They're not answering calls. They're not. Do, they're not actively engaged in business. So, what do you do? You, are you gonna, I told my clients. I, I mean, you could pay me to try and do this, but I'm going to be calling and leaving voicemails for a couple weeks or months, and you're just going to be paying for that. I, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I just don't feel good taking your money to do that because th- there there is no outcome that we can get you that you're going to be satisfied with. Right? That makes sense. So. That was another uh, the, another part of that problem in trying to negotiate an exit um, or mutual termination with the franchisor that's that's MIA right or in the verge of uh, bankruptcy. So um, yeah, those are the thoughts. I mean, the, the other option is going nuclear, filing a lawsuit. I know a couple clients did did that. Uh, I don't know the basis for it in particular, um, and they may not have filed just yet. They may still be trying to negotiate it, but I I don't see how they're going to escape. Uh, the franchise agreement without filing a lawsuit very likely. Um, just there's nobody left there, right? So, uh, yeah, you know, we connected them with some litigators in California to to try and, and push that point and see where they're, where they're going. Of course, it's so early, nothing's been resolved at this stage. You know, we'll do an update video in a few months probably to see where, what happened, kind of a debrief. Um, but, yeah, if you're facing that, if you've got a franchisor that is in trouble, um, facing bankruptcy, reach out. We can chat with you. We can give you some advice. Uh, maybe maybe there's a, a place there where we can negotiate a mutual termination, or maybe it makes sense just to, you know, continue operating until they disappear and just you know do your thing. Uh, and there's no, like I said, there's no sheriff that's going to come around. You know, there's no one there left to enforce the agreement. There's no money. So um, I've had clients that did that for years. Franchise or disappeared. They operated for I don't know five or six years until they sold it or got reti- or retired or whatever. I forget. And nobody came. There's nobody left, so it's fine. You know, which is it's nuts. This is kind of the dark side of the franchise world, right? So, anyways, this is running a little long. Um, I'll let you guys get going and uh, reach out to us. We can be of assistance to you in the franchise world. Um, yeah. So hopefully that was interesting for you. We'll uh, we'll do a follow up in the near future when some more details are known.